Uh, raise your hand, Dick. I'll give you one outline. Uh, there, uh, we're in Luke chapter 22 this morning. Luke 22. It is interesting how the world, uh, how uh, how our days work. That uh, we get to, to see people that we haven't seen for a lot of years, and uh, the blessings that uh, take place. So Luke 22. So if you've got your Bibles, I encourage you to open up to Luke chapter 22. We got a blessing in Sunday school, and I hope you were getting a blessing. Now tonight we're going to get another blessing from the book, and uh, trust that'll be a blessing. We're in First Corinthians, and uh, we'll be looking at a text there. We're in First. Uh, we're in Luke chapter twenty-two here this morning, and uh, we're winding down on Luke. There's not not a lot left here. Not a lot left here. There's uh, 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 only a few more chapters left here. Uh, and uh, we're going to be looking at his last night with the disciples. Uh, so our, our uh, Savior now we're on that last uh, bit of time. The, the Lord's Supper uh, has uh, uh, taken place here. He's been with his disciples in that upper room. And uh, I believe that much of this was uh, talked, talked about right here in the upper room. And we're privileged to uh, to partake of that, to get uh, hear some of the things that were said here. And I'm going to begin reading in verse number 23, Luke 22, beginning in verse number 23. And they begin to inquire among themselves which it should do this thing. Now, that inquiry in verse uh, 23 dealt with the, the betrayal. Uh, in verse 28, and that's kind of where we're starting right now, it's all part of the, first there was discussion about the disciples, who's going to be greatest, strife among them, who should be greatest, and uh, I preached on that last week, and uh, the disciples wrongly thought that uh, one of the disciples would rise up and take the place of Jesus. You know something? Nobody can take the place of Jesus. And uh, he has to straighten them out on this. And, uh, and by the way, it'd be a sad thing uh, if a if a pastor someday thought he was in the place of Jesus, wouldn't it? And I hate to tell you this, but there's some pastors that seem to put themselves in the place of Jesus and are saying things that he didn't say. And they're adding to it. And we can't add to anything he said. It's enough. And he has the Holy Spirit, and he gives us that Holy Spirit, but we can have him in us. But there's only one Savior, and his name is Jesus. And uh, we're going to pick up now down to verse number 28 here. And while they were, uh, uh, and they are, they which have continued with me in my temptations. And that's speaking of his disciples there. And I appointed unto you a kingdom, as my Father hath appointed unto me, and that ye may eat and drink at my table in the kingdom, and sit on the thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And the Lord said to Simon, uh, said, Simon, uh, behold, uh, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may shift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, to strengthen thy brethren. And he said unto him, Lord, I'm ready, and that is Peter said unto him, uh, Lord, I am ready to go with thee both to prison and to death. And he said, that's Jesus said, I tell thee, Peter, the rock cock shall not crow this day before thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. And he said unto them, When I sent you out with a purse and script and no shoes, lack ye anything? And they said, Nothing. And he said, But now he that hath purse lets him take it, and likewise script, that he may have no, uh, no sword, let him buy his garment and sell it. For I say unto you, that this shall be written to accomplish in me. And he was uh, uh, reckoned among the transgressions and the things concerning me have no end, have an end. And verse uh, 38, and last verse here, and they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. He said to them, it is enough. And uh, let's pray. Uh, Father, uh, I pray that you'd loosen this stammering tongue and allow me to speak now with clarity and truth. And I pray that your people would see some things here that perhaps they've never seen before and would just become even more aware of just how great you are and how loving you are and about your great plan. And I pray that loosen now this stammering tongue and allow me to speak with truth. In Jesus' name, amen. 
So uh, we're looking at the commendation to the 11 disciples. Judas is left, and, uh, and he's going to uh, commend them. And in verse 28, the commend first, Ye are they which have con con continued with me in my temptations. And of course, uh, the life of Jesus was filled with temptations. Uh, uh, he faced persecution. He faced hatred. He faced all of those things. And, uh, and any one of those things, they could have overwhelmed him. You know, uh, uh, quite frankly, you face temptations, don't you? Uh, Christians face temptations. Uh, uh, you get saved, you start living for the Lord, and you might have a, a loved one, maybe a, a, a mate, uh, maybe a child, maybe a, a neighbor, that, and they, they uh, begin to criticize you because you're trying to live for the Lord, because you're going to church. And they see no purpose of going to church, so they, they criticize you f for it. And sometimes you could have relatives, uh, siblings, cousins that you've known all of your life and you count them as your friend and suddenly they begin to treat you like you're uh, like there's something wrong upstairs or you're a little you're a little crazy and uh, and uh, they they criticize you and they 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 don't want your to have their children around you and and uh, friend those sorts of things take place and but but uh, Jesus I'm sure his disciples faced great temptations like that while they followed him and he said ye are they which continue with, with me in my temptations and notice the personal nature of that you see Jesus faced that, that sort of hatred and variance and strife in his own household and Jesus uh, said uh, you've continued to me during my times of temptations and now he talks about a compensation so first we see the commendation to the 11 and now we see the compensation to the 12 and he said uh, I appointed you a kingdom uh, verse uh, 29 and I appoint unto you a kingdom as my father hath appointed unto me and uh, and uh, so now we see that in the kingdom to come that the disciples have a special role in the kingdom now if you want to waste a lot of time you could begin speculating what that means you know what it means I don't know I don't know and anybody that says they do know is uh, is pure conjecture uh, uh, I believe that uh, the disciples will be involved in a leadership possession in position in the kingdom to come and uh, he said this I've appointed you a kingdom as my father hath appointed me so we can understand that someday in eternity future uh, we're going to hear about the disciples aren't we we're going to hear about them and they're going to be great leaders in the kingdom to come and some say well you really believe there's a kingdom to come I believe my uh, savior tells the truth I believe he doesn't lie and I believe there's a kingdom coming and I believe that someday he's going to sit on the throne and under that throne he's going to have various uh, uh, ruler, uh, rulers and, and part of those rulers some of those rulers are going to be his disciples are they going to be all? I think there'll even be more. I think there'll be more leaders. You know, uh, this world is a big place. And uh, that kingdom would come. He's going to be over uh, all the people. Uh, all the people. Uh, uh, this is after the resurrection here. Even at my father at the point of the, uh, unto me. And you may eat and drink at my table in the kingdom. You know, uh, in the scripture, oftentimes there's references to meals that take place. And they'll talk about people that taking different places as sitting at the high table. And there's a mention of a room. Now, I don't know if you've ever really thought that through, but here's what happened. Uh, let's say you're, you're uh, fairly wealthy and you're having a big meal at your house and you invite people to come. And the people that come, you've got uh, several rooms in your house. And in each room, you've got a big table. And you set the table. So you've got a table in that room, and you've got a table in this room, a table in that room. Now, friend, my family's not that big, but we got a big living room and a kitchen. And our kitchen extends, and we can set that table. We can seat. How many can we get at that table, honey? Can we get about 25 people at that table? Probably about 25 people at that table. You say, wow, that, that's a big table. Well, listen, there are going to be many at the table with our Savior. And uh, you know something? Uh, 
and the, in the in the in the Old Testament dispensation, uh, that's prior to his death, burial, and resurrection. It talks about in the New Testament. Uh, he he goes to various feasts, and uh, Jesus uses the analogy of uh, tables, and he said, if you're eating at a lower table, meaning a table in perhaps one of the other rooms, and the master sees you, he might elevate you to a higher table. And uh, boy, wouldn't that be something? And of course, we saw that in the in the scripture, it teaches about people kind of clamoring to get the upper table as if somehow that was up to them. I got news for you. We'll be surprised who's sitting at the chief tables with our Savior. I believe that there's going to be a, a, a and it's not going to be co a, a controlled by the size of the room. I, I think it's going to be a huge area and uh, his, uh, his people, uh, including you, if you're saved, are going to be seated at a table. And there's going to be people that maybe are at higher tables. And these are people that have done more for the Lord. And you say, well, I don't know if I like that. I don't care. Just be glad you're there. Just be glad you're there. Because it's going to be a great honor to be at the table with our Savior in the kingdom to come. And he said this. He said, I've appointed you. And you may sit on the thrones. You may eat and drink at the, my table in the kingdom. And, and look again. Now at verse number 30. You may eat and drink at the table in the kingdom. And sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes. And so now we see the, the, the uh, apostles are going to be elevated to the place that they're going to sit on thrones judging over the 12 tribes of Israel. They say, oh, well, I'm not of the 12 tribe, I'm a Gentile. Well, the Lord will let you know what's going to happen then. And you know something? The preacher that tells you what it's going to be is imagining things that's not in the scripture. We don't know. We don't know. But I know he's followed this pattern with his 12. They're going to be sitting there and he says this, about those people you're going to eat and drink at my table in the kingdom his focus is on the 11 I say 11 and I keep saying 11 because Judas is gone he's out doing the betraying work right now so he's focused on his on his 11 and and uh, then said uh, Matthew chapter 19 verse 27 then answered Peter said behold we've forsaken all and follow thee what shall we have therefore Jesus said to him verily I say to you ye which have followed me in the generation when the son of man shall sit on his throne of his glory ye shall sit on the twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel and every one that hath forsaken houses or brethren or sisters or fathers or mothers or wives or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life but many that are first shall be last and the last shall be first by the way that uh, passage in Matthew is just a real profound one isn't it it lets us know that in the end in the end his disciples are going to be sitting on the 12 thrones, uh, thrones of Israel. You say, well, 12 thrones, uh, you just said there's only 11. Now, how can there be 12? You can ask him when you see him, because uh, I don't understand. And again, some things in Scripture, don't let somebody answer it for you. This is like a mystery, but it's true nonetheless. He said that judging the 12 tribes of Israel, and now the conversation of Jesus with one of the 12, Simon Peter. So the Lord now is letting him know it's coming, it's coming. Judas is off getting ready. He's betraying him even as he's talking to his disciples. And Jesus is encouraging his 12. I believe this took place in the upper room. I believe they're still there. Uh, it might be not, uh, but it makes no difference. He's talking to the 11 and he's encouraging them. And now he's got something to say to one of the 12, uh, one of the 11. And who is it? It's uh, Simon Peter. Peter. It's Peter. And Jesus reveals to, to uh, uh, Peter a trial. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. Now, what's going to take place is Peter is going to go through a tough time of temptation. That's what the sifting is all about. Peter's going to, uh, uh, by the way, he doesn't do so well in the trial. 
uh, he, uh, denying the Savior, as the Satan is going to try to get him to deny the Savior. That's part of the sifting process here. Now, I got news for you. If you get saved, you're going to go through some sifting. I know hardly any Christians that don't go through some sifting. And the sifting often comes from people that, that have sat at the same table. I hate to say this, meaning that it's within families and it's within friends. And when a person makes a profession of faith and gets saved, there's a change that takes place in their life. And those people that, uh, uh, here's a sad one, uh, those people that are going to do the sifting sometimes uh, are unsaved. And that's the picture here of the sifting that's going to take place. And the sifting is trials. As a matter of fact, uh, I'll tell you something. When, uh, when, I got, when I got right with the Lord, now listen, I got saved when I was a young man. And, and uh, when I hit my teen years, I got rebellious. And I kind of turned my back on, a few, on the Lord for a while. And during that time, I was received by the world. You want to be received by the world? Live like the world. But you know something? If you start trying to live for Jesus Christ, and you start trying to live out your profession that you love the Lord, you're going to face some trials. You know, isn't that interesting? The world says, you're so judgmental. Listen, no one is more judgmental in the world. The world hates people that are living for the Lord. No one's more judgmental. No one's more cruel. Save people love people. Save people don't try to hurt people. Save people don't talk behind people's backs. At least they're not supposed to. But you see, the, the world is been confused and, and been deceived by Satan himself. And they want to say, well, well, if you're going to go that route, that means you're judgmental. It's just the opposite. It's just the opposite. Uh, would you make a choice for Jesus Christ? And friend, don't you think it's only fair that everybody ought to make their own choices? I think it's fair. If you make a choice for Jesus Christ, you know what? Some people in the world are going to hate you because you made that choice. And, uh, and, that, and so he says, Satan, he says, trials are going to come your way. And he said, the source of the trial. That's what people don't understand, who the source is. Now listen, if you're going through some sifting right now, some people that are criticizing you, I want you to understand the source of your sifting. It's Satan. It's Satan. And Satan is using your friends sometimes to sift you. And, and so Satan here is the one that's talked about here. And, uh, and, uh, and Satan uh, is going uh, to put him on trial. And he said, look at verse 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. And, uh, and so now Jesus talks to Simon Peter. Remember, they're in the upper room. They're having a meal. They're just done with. And now they're telling him, he says, listen, listen, Simon. He said, uh, you're going to go through some trials here. It's coming. It's coming. And Satan wants to sift you. He wants you to deny me. And uh, the reason, he said, uh, well, we see the reason, verse 32. But I prayed, pr prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. Now that's Satan's desire. Satan wants to get us not to trust the Lord. And when persecution comes, Satan wants us to give up. He wants us to turn our back on the Lord, to go the other way. It's like, like the, the lost person that wants to sift. They say, well, I, I'm not trying to get you. Yes, you are. You're trying to get us to deny our Savior. You're trying to tell us that to go in another direction. And so he says, listen, he said, he wants to sift you as wheat. But I prayed for you that your, thy faith fail not. Uh, so the Lord reveals to Peter. He said, listen, he said, he wants to sift you. Now, I'll tell you something. If the Lord spoke to me personally and said, but I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. Whew. Whew. That's something wonderful. And friend, I'll tell you something. I've known a lot of Christians that have gone through sifting. And, and you know what? I've seen them come out the other side. Uh, uh, they still believe. They might have some scars from the sifting. They might have some struggles as they're going through it. 
But listen, if a person is saved, he's going to one day stand with Jesus Christ. I don't care if there's some scars. I don't care if there's some stumbling. I don't care if they have some struggles. They're going to come out the other side. They're going to be with Jesus because once saved, always saved. When Jesus saves, he saves eternally. And no amount of sifting is going to change your end. You're going to be with the Lord. And he said, I prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. He says, you're going to be converted. Now, conversion speaks of a change, doesn't it? All right. So, okay, what changed? Well, he got tempted. And evidently that temptation was enough that it took away something and the Lord says but when you're back you're coming back it's like it's like I say it like this the Lord says when you're sifted you're gonna fall but you're gonna get back up and you're gonna be okay do you know some Christians that have fallen and got back up and been okay I know numbers of Christians that have had struggles and stumbles when I was a kid, when I was going to Bible camp, I was standing strong for the Lord. I fell down in my teen years. I fell down in my teen years. And if you looked at me and you looked at the manner of my life, you'd say, that fellow's not saved. But you know something? The Lord wasn't done. The Lord wasn't done. Because once saved, I was saved. I don't know what Peter did. I don't care what Peter did. I'm not telling you what I did. It's none of your business. But I'm telling you, I fell away from the Lord. But when I turned back, the Lord forgave me and got me back on the right tack. You say, well, what happened? Well, I like the word converted. I didn't get saved again. But I got back on track with the Lord Jesus Christ. So don't use that word converted there like a lost person getting saved. He's using a term that he gave to Peter. He said, when you got back on track, you're going to come back. You're going to return. And how did I get back? Why did I get back? Well, look at verse 32. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. I got back because of Jesus. You know, once you're saved, Jesus never forgets his own. Once you've turned to the Lord, Luke 32, 22, verse 32, I have prayed for thee, thy faith fail not. When thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And you know what? Once you're saved, you're saved, you're saved, you're saved. You might have times that you stumble. You might have times that you fall. But you're not lost. The Lord one day is going to get you back on your feet. You say, preacher, do you actually believe that? I believe that. I believe that Peter stumbled. What does that mean? I believe that through that temptation of Satan, as the Satan began to tempt him, at some point, he probably said something like a lost person would say. But he got right. He changed. And he, he came back to the Lord. And the Lord lifted him up and put him back on track. Or preacher, you sound like you're pretty generous with the grace of God. Well, you know something? He just got a bunch of lost sinners to deal with. He knows who we are. He knows our weaknesses. He knows our struggles. He knows at times we're going to stumble. He knows sometimes we're going to fall. He knows sometimes we might say things we shouldn't say, do things we shouldn't do. But he loves us. And he'll turn us around, and he'll help turn us around. And when we come back to him, he'll restore us. And so he says this, When thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. That word strengthen there, as you can see from your all, it literally means make steadfast your brethren. Now, uh, I don't like to use my testimony very much because uh, I'm ashamed of it. I'm ashamed of my testimony because I got saved at a Bible camp, 
I've always had a heart for Bible camps. When I got in the ministry, I jumped at the chance to start this Bible camp. Jumped at it. Jumped at it. Because I got saved at a Bible camp. And I have preached at Bible camp many, many years. And we've seen many, 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 many people make professions of faith and salvation during Bible camp. And you know something? I'm so glad. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. Because once saved, I was saved. And I've talked to campers that have gotten right with God and come back to me and said, you know, you were right. I struggled for a bit, but I got back on track. God's not done with you when you get saved. When you get saved, it's the eternal thing. Simon, uh, Simon now responds, responds to the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, maybe you're here now and you've never had that happen where you've never fallen away. Praise God. There's no excuse for David for Peter's falling away. He never should have, but he did. But there's a lot of Christians that have stumbled. I want to say this, and I say this in a, in, a, in a true way. I think one of the things that helps me be a good pastor is the fact that I stumbled at one time. And I know a person can stumble. And if you've stumbled right now, I want to tell you something. He still loves you. He still. And I can see it because I because I experienced it. I fell away. Was it his fault? Was it anybody's fault but mine? I felt the temptation. I lived like the devil for a little while. But when I turned back, when I turned back, the Lord received me with open arms. I've, not, I've never, I haven't shared my testimony very often. And uh, I'm tempted to share just a little bit of it. But uh, we had two girls, uh, Jessica and, uh, and uh, Jennifer. And during that period of time, I fell away from the Lord. And uh, when Jenny was born, our daughter Jenny, she has Down syndrome, so she's learning disabled. And that broke my heart, broke my wife's heart too. But you know something? We never looked at her anything other than a gift of God. We never looked down at her or felt sorry for ourselves. She was always a blessing to us. But I think Jenny was about two or three, something like that. And I was struggling with it, and I was going through a period of time where I was searching. And I got my Bible out, and I started searching for God again. And after ignoring God for seven or eight years, all of a sudden I'm back on a quest for God. And I'm reading the Scripture, I'm reading how God healed people and could, could take away certain things. And I... I uh, I read it and read it and read it and read it and I realized that I was not right with God and I prayed and I said, God, I repented of my sin and said, God, there's got to be a change in my life. I'm going to change. I'm coming back, Lord. I'm going to live for you. I haven't been a husband I should have. have been the dad that I should have been. I'm going to change. And when I got done praying that prayer, I began thinking about Jenny and I knew that God heals people and I, so I... I <laughs> I went in my daughter's bedroom and I kneeled beside the bed. I didn't wake her up. And I laid my hands on Jenny and I said, God, heal Jenny. Make her normal. God, help her be all that she could be for you. And I prayed and prayed and I went away and I felt empty. I felt like nothing happened. Now it's at about one o'clock in the morning. Two o'clock, I was back in there praying that same prayer. And I knew nothing happened. Three o'clock, I was back in there praying the same prayer. This time, God just can't explain it. But he just gave me a real sense that he heard my prayer and answered my prayer. And I went to bed. 
it's now it's about 3 30 4 o'clock in the morning slept till six woke up felt like a million bucks felt like i'd slept all night i felt so energized and so excited i knew i was right with the lord and i knew that god had done something with jenny and uh, so i'm sitting on the couch uh no my re recliner in the corner men need recliners ladies i was sitting in the recliner and my wife was sitting on the couch on the other side of the room and uh, the girls got up jessica got up first and then jennifer came up got up and by the way when jennifer got up the first thing she did she come over and sidled up next to me and and uh and let me hold her for a second until that person came into the room <laughs> uh, she gets down from me and she saddles up next to her, her mama as she's on the couch and uh, i'm afraid to talk to her because I, I knew God had done something, but I didn't want to have no faith. I thought I'm not going to I'm not going to test the Lord to see if she talks different or if anything else is different. And uh, I'm watching her over there, and I still got the Bible in my Bible. I got the Bible back out. I'm reading again about the grace of God and the love of God, and I'm looking at Jenny leaning up against her mama's knee. And her mama's hair, hand on her hair. And then the next one that got up was Jessica. She was the last one up. And she walked by. And I, I can still remember that. And as she walked by, Jennifer reached out and petted her like you'd pet a dog. And all of a sudden, boom, like the Holy Spirit just spoke to my heart. And I said to my wife, I said, honey, I got to tell you what something happened last night. And I told her about me getting right with God and about me praying and me praying that God would heal her and that God would do something for Jenny. And I remember telling my wife, I said to her, tears running down my face. I said, honey, all this time, I thought something was wrong with Jenny. There's not been anything wrong with Jenny. All Jenny has given to anybody and everybody is love. She gave it to me, she gave it to you. When she walked out, when Jenny, when Jessica walked by and she reached out and she petted her like that, I realize there's nothing wrong with Jenny. All she ever gives is love. But honey, there's been something wrong with me. I haven't been the husband that I should have been. I haven't been the dad. But things are changing. Things are changing. I'm going to be the man that God wanted me to be. I don't know how many years it was after that that I was in the ministry, but it wasn't long, it was maybe seven years. I started going to a church right away with her. It happened to be a Lutheran church. I left the Lutheran church after a few years because it wasn't doctrine on love. Went to Grace Baptist Church in, Leon, in, in Edgerton that had just started. You know, Peter, when thou art converted, returned strengthen thy brethren well I like Peter have returned and God has given me a job of strengthening the brethren that's my job that's the job of every pastor it's not making building buildings it's not doing this it's not doing that it's strengthening God's people to face the challenges and so he said in verse 32, he said, I prayed for thee when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. That's a noble cause. That's a worthy ministry. Simon Peter in his pride said this, Lord, I won't stumble. Okay. We've got a lot of people here right now. Maybe you'd say, I'll never stumble. 
You know, Proverbs 16, 18, pride goeth before destruction, haughty spirit before a fall. Uh, listen, Luke says in verse uh, uh, 22, verse 33, he said to him, I'm ready to go to thee, both the prison to death for thee. I won't stumble. And the Lord told him something different. Luke chapter 14, verse 29. But Peter said, Although all be offended, I will, yet not I. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this day, even this night, before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. But he spake more vehemently. Peter is still arguing. If I should die with thee, I will not deny thee in any wise. Likewise also said they, uh, they, they said all. But you know, that rebuke in, in verse 34, Luke 22, verse 34, I tell thee, the cock shall not crow this day before thou uh, shalt tw thrice deny that thou knowest me. You know, uh, I got news for you. If you're saved and you're doing well, praise God. But don't assume that you'll never fall. I'm going to say this, and I say this in love. I know of Christians that have been saved for a number of years that have fallen away from the Lord. they got no excuse for it. But suggest, to suggest that God will not redeem them is wrong. Our ministry, your ministry, my ministry is to reach out to those people and tell them God still loves you. Come on home. God wants to bless you. Come on back. Come on back. And Jesus rebukes him before the cock crow this day, thou shalt deny, thrice deny that thou knowest me. Matthew says it a little bit different. Matthew 20, 26, 33. Peter answered and said, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet I never be offended. Jesus said to him, That this night before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And Peter said, Though I should die with thee, I will not defend thee. Likewise said all the disciples. In verse 32 is a great verse. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. You know, the interesting thought about that is the Lord saying to that individual that comes and gets right with God, I haven't given up on you. And when you get right, and when you get right, I want you to help other brethren. Now, I want to tell you, say this to you, and I'll say this with all love. If you've ever fallen away from the Lord, you've gotten back with the Lord, don't hide it. Because there's other brethren that have stumbled and they need to hear from somebody that has stumbled. I want you to hear from me. I stumbled and God wasn't done with me yet. And God's not done with me yet. Someone said, how long you been in the ministry? I guess it's been about 38, 39 years as a pastor. Before that, a deacon for about seven years. God's not done with me yet. And friend, God's not done with you yet. And you might find that very thing that you're, you're stumbling over and you get right. God's not done using you, using you, using you. And now he gives others instructions to the eleven. He said, before I sent you without a purse and script and shoes, did you lack anything? And they said, nothing. You see, up till now, the Lord has taken care of all their needs while they were ministering. So as they went, they were getting fed. They were getting, they were getting taken care of by the grace of God through gifts and other things. And he said, it's all going to change now. Now it's going to change. He said, now take your purse with you. And your script, take it with you. And he that hath no sword, let him buy his garment and buy one. Let him sell his garment and buy one. Verse 36 says that. 
for I say unto you, it's written that there must be a, the uh, it, yeah, for I say to that this is written, you must be uh, accomplished in me. Verse thirty-seven. For I say unto you that this is written must yet be accomplished in me, and he was reckoned among the transgressors, and for the things concerning me have no end. And again, this reminds us, the Lord is saying, listen, there's some things that are going to take place real soon. He says, I'm going to suffer for you in verse 37. And I'm going to die for you again, verse 37. I'm going to be reckoned with the transgressors, and I'm going to die and in verse 38, and the Lord said, here are two swords. And he said, uh, he asked about a sword. And he said, uh, they said, Lord, here are two swords. And he said, it's enough. Two swords. I could probably preach a sermon on two swords. <laughs> and it doesn't even tell us what the two swords are, but I know what the two swords are with me. My personal testimony is one sword. Peter had a testimony that God had restored him. And I've got another sword, the one more familiar, the Word of God. God has given you a testimony if you're saved. And God has given you the Word of God to seal it and to signify it and help you. And then he arrived and he said in verse 40, and this is a great verse here, and he withdrew himself and knelt down and prayed. And a stone cast, and he prayed. And then in verse 42, he said this, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not thy will, but thine be done. You know, even at this time, our Savior knew the terrible suffering that he was going to go through. He said, Lord, if there's another way, then Calvary, remove it from me. But you know, the Lord didn't remove it from him. He had to go to Calvary. And uh, I've got news for you. We've got to go through things in life too. God doesn't remove the things of life from us as well. He doesn't put a cross in front of us, but the Bible says we're to bear our cross and carry our cross. He's not going to kill us, but you know something? There are some Christians that are going to die for their faith, aren't there? And there, he says in verse 42, Nevertheless, that thy will be done. Verse 43, And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. That last prayer that uh, the Lord prayers in verse 42 and verse 43, there's a real uh, uh, inference there that he had separated himself slightly from the disciples. And this was his personal prayer to the Lord. If it's your will, Lord, to take this from me. I don't think he prayed that in the presence of his disciples. I think he prayed that privately. And I think the agony is shown again in verse 44, Luke 22, verse 44. Being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. His sweat, as it were, great drops of blood falling uh, to the ground. So the, the earnestness and the struggle that he was having. And someone said, what is he struggling over? Why is that so hard? Well, let me just say it like this. The Bible says that the Lord laid upon him our sin. Our Savior had never touched sin. He was sinless and pure. But on Calvary, he became our sin bearer. What does that mean? That means the sins of all mankind were placed on him. The sins of all mankind were placed upon him. Imagine that. The sin, of, the sin of adultery, the sin of fornication, the sin of, uh, of just, you just imagine the worst sin you could be. And that guilt, that sin was laid upon him. And the Lord said, if there's another way, and the Lord said, there's no other way. The only way we could be saved is if our sin is laid upon our Savior. And our Savior took, carried it to Calvary. And he carried it to the grave and he rose sinless and pure. That's the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel is, is that Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, and the third day he rose again. And so when he knew that was going to take place very soon, 
great drops of sweat came from him in agony. He prayed more earnestly and he said, God, if there's another way, if there's another way. But there was no other way. When he rose up from prayer, look at verse uh, 45, when he rose up from prayer and come to his disciples, he found them sleeping as for sorrow. He said to them, why sleep? Arise and pray lest ye enter into temptation. And that's his closing. He gets back at his feet and he goes back and takes his disciples. And now, and now soon, the betrayer is going to come. And he's going to be taken. He's going to be beaten. He's going to be crucified. Our sin is going to be laid upon him. The sin of humanity is going to be laid upon him. He's going to die with that upon him on the cross. For he died for our sins. And he's going to be buried. And on the third day he rises again victorious over sin. He's our sin bearer. He carries our sin to the grave. He rises sinless and pure. Our text today is a little difficult to preach because it's hard for me to comprehend all of those things that we're talking about here. It doesn't fall into an easy pattern, but it's all there. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel is, is that God loves you and you and you and you and you and you and me. And he saves us. And even if we stumble, and if, even if we fall, He doesn't give up on us. He doesn't want us to fall. But He'll always restore us if we but turn to Him. And someone said, well, what happens if a person falls into sin and they don't repent? Listen, if they were saved, they're still going to heaven. God will cleanse them on the way up. You say, preacher, you believe that? I believe that there's salvation in Jesus Christ. When a person cries out and asks to be saved, I believe God saves, God saves, God saves, God saves. And praise God if in this life they repent and they get back right after they fall into sin. Praise God. But if they don't, if they truly ask Jesus Christ to save them, and Jesus saved them, Jesus saved them. He said, Preacher, you sound like you believe in something called eternal security. I do. I do. Because I'll tell you something, no matter how spiritual anyone is and appears to others, we're all still just sinners saved by grace. That's all we are. We're all sinners saved by grace if we put our faith and trust in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he died for sins. The scripture says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Has there been a time in your life when you've called upon the name of Jesus and been saved? Friend, I don't know. But he does. And I think you know too. And if you've not done that yet, I pray you'll do that today. I pray you'll do that today. Let's close in prayer. Father, Lord, I know you're a savior. You're the savior. You're the king of kings, the Lord of lords. And Lord, we're at that text where you're just about ready to be crucified and you're leading up there and you're talking to your disciples. And, and Lord, now I pray you've talked to these people here. And Lord, if there's one here that has not received you as their personal savior, may they know something that you love them greatly. May they know that you are willing to be their sin bearer and all they have to do is plead, is cry out and say, Lord Jesus, please save me. And their sins, like the sins of, of my sins, will have been taken care of on Calvary. And if there's one here that's struggling and just doesn't know how to say it, may they pray or simply say, Lord Jesus, I'm, I'm lost, please save me. And Lord Jesus, I pray you'll honor your word and save them and take away the guilt and the shame of that sin and restore unto them and give them joy unspeakable and full of glory. May they leave this place filled with peace because they got their eternal destiny settled here this morning. Lord Jesus, thank you for being my Savior. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for getting me back on track. Thank you for using me. Thank you for using me today. 
to share these truths with your people. And again, Lord, if there's one here that's lost, may they ask you to save them today. And Lord Jesus, I believe, whosoever shall call upon your name shall be saved. Bless us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.